Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this gorgeous Vancouver March, last day of March evening. I want to thank you for joining us here at Insight Hooked with Michael Moss. We are so glad that you could be here. My name is Amber Ritchie. I'm from the Vancouver Public Library, the Adult Programming Department. And I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that my homeland, my home, and the Vancouver Public Library is located on the traditional and unceded homeland and territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. This evening's part of Insight, Captivating Explorations of Books and Ideas. And this series is presented in partnership between the Vancouver Writers' Fest and the Vancouver Public Library. We hope that you enjoy it, as well as other upcoming library events. I'd like to tell you about one that's coming next week, Tuesday, April 6th. We will have Andre Picard in conversation with Catherine Gretzinger as Andre discusses his new book, Neglected No More. It talks about ideas on how to fix elder care crisis, which has definitely been highlighted in this country during the pandemic. That's next Tuesday, 7 p.m., right here on your computer screen. More information about this event and others the library puts on can be found at our website, vpl.ca slash events, or by signing up for our email newsletter. Now, for the main event, please join me in a warm welcome as I pass things over to Leslie Hertig, Artistic Director of the Vancouver Writers' Fest. Thank you so much, Amber. Good evening and welcome to Insight featuring Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist Michael Moss talking with us about his new book, Hooked, Food, Free Will and How Food Giants Exploit Our Addictions. Michael will be joined this evening by Globe and Mail health journalist Andrea Wu, who will talk with him a bit about his new book and then turn it over to you, our viewers, to ask some questions of your own. We would like to thank our Insight partner this evening, the Vancouver Public Library, for their collaboration and support in this series. Also, thank you to our government sponsors, the Government of Canada, the Government of BC, the BC Arts Council, the City of Vancouver, and CMHC Granville Island. This is our sixth Insight event of the season. And just a reminder that we'll be hosting these events every other Wednesday between now and June, as well as some special events, including our digital book club. Tickets are now on sale for our spring book club featuring one of America's most highly regarded contemporary authors, Viet Tan Nguyen, in conversation with Scotia Giller Prize winner, Ian Williams. Viet's new book, The Committed, is a follow-up to his Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, The Sympathizer, and is both a political literary thriller and a captivating and, at times, uproariously funny novel of ideas. This event will take place on Sunday, May 16th, and tickets are now on sale. And mark your calendars, our festival will return this fall in the third week of October. The format for tonight is pretty straightforward. I'll soon be tuning, turning things over to Michael, who will talk with us about his new book. And then we'll be inviting Andrew Wu on screen to chat with Michael and take some questions from you. We'll get to as many of those as possible before we wrap up in approximately 75 minutes or so. And now please let me introduce our host and our guest. Andrea Wu is a health journalist at the Globe and Mail based in Vancouver. Her work focuses largely on substance use, addiction, mental health, and Canada's overdose crisis. We feel really happy to have her joining us here tonight, especially considering how immensely busy she's been reporting on both the COVID-19 and continuing drug crises here in Vancouver. And our guest this evening is Michael Moss. He is the author of the number one best-selling Salt, Sugar, Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us. He's also a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter, formerly of the New York Times, and a keynote speaker all over the world. He is now back with his new book, Hooked, Food, Free Will, and How the Food Giants Exploit Our Addictions. Please welcome to our virtual Vancouver stage, Michael Moss. Hey, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and what a fabulous festival. I hope I can make um, 
some more of your uh, your events. It's a great thing. Um, it's a great thing you're doing, and I'm so glad the library is a sponsor as well. Um, so I thought I would give a little bit of a overview about how I got to to writing about food, um, both the first book and then and then this this second book. Um, uh, and uh, and I'm really looking forward to your questions. So. So write those down and keep those coming. Um, that would be really great. In, and, and for me, this kind of journey uh, into the world of food actually began in 2008 when I was in Algeria interviewing Islamic militants. When a couple of FBI agents showed up at the New York Times headquarters in New York looking for me, I'd been traveling to Iraq first to torment the Pentagon for failing to equip soldiers and Marines with basic body armor and vehicle armor long after the war in Iraq began. And then I was traveling around the Middle East, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Morocco, and finally Algeria, kind of looking at how the war on terrorism itself was having these unintended consequences of of, of empowering militants to recruit new members. Um, and somehow, according to the FBI, all of that reporting sort of managed to land me on an Al Qaeda hit list. I had a nagging suspicion that really it was the Algerian government that was trying to get rid of me. But at any rate, my editors called me up and ordered me on the next plane home. And I really sort of mentioned that only because. I ended up going from one war to a much bigger one because um, we were sitting around at the New York Times trying to decide what I should do next. And my editor, Christine Kay, said, hey, Michael, what do you think about peanuts? You know, and I had gone from, you know, gazillion dollar U.S. arms sales overseas and and the war and the war on terrorism and now she's going peanuts and she goes no no hear me out there's been an outbreak of salmonella in peanuts made by this factory in southern georgia on the alabama border you know we this is actually something healthy parents are giving to their kids or supposedly healthy it's made right here in the usa we can't blame some other country for this problem and and these peanuts are being used as ingredients by this this thing called the processed food industry about which we we really know very little and and sure enough when i went down there and did some reporting you know it became kind of this window on this trillion dollar cartel if you will of powerful companies that in this case um had lost control over their food chain because they were using these peanuts um, in hundreds of products, um, and it was taking them weeks to figure out if, in fact, the tainted peanuts from this particular factory were in their products. And so the recalls were going on for weeks and weeks, and people were getting sick by the thousands around, around the country. Um, and then, you know, I turned my reporting to looking at E. coli and hamburger, and that was kind of a case of the processed meat industry intentionally losing control over its food chain in order to avoid costly recalls. And I was, I was talking one night, having dinner actually with a, a good source of mine, a scientist who was in Seattle, who was testing meat for the, uh, for the meat industry for E. coli. And, you know, and he said to me, you know, Michael, as, as tragic as these incidents of contamination are, you really should look at the things that my industry is intentionally adding to its products um, and he was he was mostly concerned about all of the salt that goes into processed meat and and I took a look at that and then I looked at sugar and then fat and 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 it you know it just I realized this is this unholy trinity on which the processed food industry relies on to make its products cheap and, and convenient and irresistibly yummy for us and so and so that kind of became the first book because I got really lucky and came across a trove of documents that took me inside the biggest companies as they were, as they were formulating and marketing and positioning their products in the grocery store and doing deals with the 
fast food restaurant industry for some synergy. Um, and it was those documents that enabled me to meet and talk to key insiders in the, of the industry who, who opened up and revealed even more secrets. And I have to say that the overwhelming sense you got from that material was, you know, this is an industry that's driving day and night to get us to not just like their products, but to but to want more and more of them. And while, you know, I've, I've, I've tried not to view this as this evil empire that intentionally set out to make us ill uh, from their products, you know, they are companies doing what all companies want to do, uh, which is to make as much money as possible by selling as much product as possible and making that product as, as attractive as possible. And I think the problem lies in their own deep dependency. Um, initially, my thought was using those three ingredients um, uh, to get us to, you know, to, to overindulge, to overwant, to become overly dependent on their on their products. And then, and the book came out and I had tried really hard to end on a hopeful note, writing something like, look, <clears throat> you know, knowledge is power, knowing that all the knowing all the tricks that the food industry uses to lure us in and keep us in um, is, is oddly empowering and will have, you know, I think can help us make better decisions about what to eat and, and how much. And the very first question I got from a reporter, I think it was a British tabloid TV reporter actually, it was like right in my face. So Michael, you know, you talk about hopefulness here, but isn't this stuff you're writing about, you know, as, as addictive as drugs, <clears throat> And I had kind of been skirting around the A word in, in Salt Creek. I, I really didn't know. And frankly, you know, this was five years ago, six years ago. It seemed a little nutso to me to be comparing Oreo cookies with, you know, meth or, or, or cocaine or, or, or heroin. And, and I have to say the little part of me um, was, was also something that said, hey, wait a minute, you know, isn't there some personal responsibility? And in food, isn't there some free will in food that maybe isn't present with with cigarettes and, and drinking and and, uh, and and harsher drugs? And so and so that became sort of the the beginning of Hooked, which was kind of looking at this question: um, to what extent are there parallels between these ultra processed food products that now make up so much of the grocery store? and other addictive substances and, and if so what what lessons might we be able to draw from those products um and i have to say in short i came full circle on my initial skepticism and now have very little doubt that for many people many of these products are even more problematic than smoking alcohol and, and drugs for reasons for reasons we can we can talk about the, the food industry almost immediately sort of threw up two big sort of obstacles, not obstacles, two big defenses to me. One was, um, look, Michael, how can you how can you call our products addictive if like not everybody loses control with them, right? And then two, you know, Twinkies and Hot Pockets and, you know, super sugary pasta stuff. This stuff doesn't have like these harsh chemicals that you find in traditionally, you know, traditionally defined addictive substances. So how can you possibly say we're addictive? Um, and, and I was struggling with kind of both of those things when a source who looks at brain uh, psychology and studies how addictive substances affect the brain suggested to me that I really should look at a little bit at the tobacco industry because I had kind of forgotten, but you know they had denied that smoking was addictive vehemently for decades, and then in the year two thousand they suddenly switched completely around. Philip Morris was the first company publicly acknowledged that smoking was not only dangerous for your health but addictive. And that same year, the CEO was in. Oh, Philip Morris was in some legal proceedings and he was asked, so, sir, what is your definition of addiction? And he goes, you know, addiction is a repetitive behavior that some people 
find difficult to quit. And I thought that was, it was such a huge moment for, for me as a journalist, because at the time in 2000, Philip Morris was not only the largest uh, uh, manufacturer of cigarettes in North America, it was the single largest manufacturer of processed foods because it bought the old New York company called General Foods, which had a bunch of big icons in the grocery store, and then Kraft, and then finally Nabisco. And for, for me, certainly, in talking to people, that definition that he came up with, he was talking about smoking, but it seemed to me that it really fit um, many of the companies own food products as well. And in fact, you know, doctors and psychologists and, and scientists who think about addiction over the years had broadened out their definition of addiction and had, had dropped some of the more restrictive criteria that they used to use, such as you need to have withdrawal symptoms and you need to have tolerance limit changes um, because they realized even drugs all drugs don't have those things. Um, and also sort of the word some that he used in that definition, a repetitive behavior that some people, I think that's really, really important um, because addiction happens on a, on a spectrum um, where some people get hard, hit harder, much harder than, than, than other people. Um, and that's also true with drugs. I mean, look, there are people who can drink casually, who can smoke casually, there are even people who can use heroin on a casual basis. And case in point, I spent some time with the former general counsel, the lead attorney for, um, for Philip Morris. And he, um, he explained to me that you know, he was one of those people who could smoke one cigarette a day at a business meeting and put his pack away and never have a compulsion to pull that pack out again until the next day. But he said, you know, Michael, I can't go near a bag of our Oreo cookies for fear of losing control and eating um, half the bag in one sitting. And I was like, my jaw kind of dropped. I go, yeah, that's, you know, again, as a journalist, it's such a moment of, of awareness because that tells you that people inside the industry you know, are aware of the, of the power of these products. And so, so how do they do it? It's, it's, you know, it's not just kind of the salt, sugar, and fat. What I realized in researching Hooked <clears throat> is that they're using our own biology, our own deep biological instincts that we have in relation to food and using that against us. And one of the scientists I met and spent time with, Dana Small, who was trained at McGill. She's from British Columbia. She was trained at McGill. She's now at Yale. Dana was the first person who figured out how to look at the brain on food. Um, because normally when you go, well, always when you go into a brain scanner, you can't chew, you can't move your head or you'll blur the images. But Dana being a self-professed chocoholic, realized she could put a square of milk chocolate on people's tongue and they could lie there still and the chocolate would melt and ooze over their tongue and reach the brain and she could watch and see what happens. Um, and she did that and the brain scans were, were absolutely fascinating. But she kind of actually pushed back on, on, on me a bit on the addiction question and said, you know, Michael, as an evolutionary biologist, and she is of those scientists who who like to say that sort of, you know, everything about sort of biology makes sense in the context of, of, of evolution. She said, look, it's not so much that we're addicted to food, um, but rather, or this food, but rather that we by nature are drawn to food. Um, and the food companies have changed the nature of our food. And boy, have they in some really dramatic, dramatic ways. Um, and, so, and so what are we talking about here? So, you know, evolutionarily, we love food that's cheap, meaning it requires the least amount of energy expenditure on our part. Only made sense when we were in hunter-gatherer societies that we would, um, you know, instead of running down an impala for dinner, we'd grab that aardvark that's sitting there. Um, and so what do the food companies do? They have these chemical laboratories working for them that mix and match ingredients 
kind of with the overarching goal of reducing the cost of products, even just knocking 10 cents off a box of breakfast toaster pastries, knowing that our brain will get excited by that cheapness of, of the food. We love by instinct variety. It's one of the reasons um, why humans were able to spread around the globe and you know love whatever food there was to eat and and turn to that food even if it was whale blubber and so what does the industry do you walk into the cereal aisle and that's why you find 200 brands of sugary starch there they know that variety excites the brain um, and maybe one of the biggest things they have going for them now is is calories fuel um, i didn't know this but we have sensors in the gut possibly also in the mouth that tell us how many calories there are in, um, in what we're eating and drinking. And for most of our existence, um, getting more calories was like a life or death thing. In fact, putting on body fat was a really good thing. It enabled our brains to grow. It enabled us to get through hard times. Um, it, um, it enables to have more babies, right? And so, so what does the food industry do? Um, it starts making these convenient snack foods that are, you know, heavy, tightly packed with empty calories that excite the brain and, and, you know, and get it, stir it up and get us acting compulsively, impulsively, um, you know, in, in, in a way that kind of overwhelms the, the thinking part of the brain. And I should mention that I love scientists, um, the scientists I met who kind of divide the brain into two parts. Um, one they describe as the go brain, which is that more primitive part of the brain that gets us to do things that keep us alive, like flee from, from danger or procreate or eat. And then there's the stop part of the brain, which basically says, hey, Michael, is, you know, is, this, is that really a good thing to be doing? And that's where kind of the, the free will and the willpower and the executive function lives. And, and I think what you find with these food products, as you do other addictive substances, is that they tend to overwhelm or they tend to excite the go brain so much that it's often running before the stop brain has, has time to, 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 to even sort of catch up. And so... So yeah, food products, you know, by tapping into these basic um, instincts of ours, you know, you know, are certainly as, as addictive as, as some of these other substances, but in some ways even more addictive because you have to kind of think about the food environment, right? I mean, you know, it's everywhere and it's so inexpensive and it's illegal. Um, you know, if, if, if you're somebody who's having trouble you know, with certain food triggers like sugar or whatever, it's like being an alcoholic and having to constantly walk by or go into a bar, right? Um, grocery shopping is really, really difficult for people who are trying to abstain from certain things like sugar, which for them are really big triggers. Um, but the other way that I realized that in some ways food is even more problematic is that one of, the, one of the hallmarks or the keystones of addiction is speed. Um, the faster substance hits the brain, the more apt the brain is to respond to that substance um, in a compulsive, impulsive sort of, sort of manner. Um, and it turns out that there's nothing faster than food in the way that it hits the, the brain. And so smoking can take as long as 10 seconds to fully activate the brain. Narcotics, alcohol, somewhat less than that. But a while ago, scientists put people down for a little test to see how fast sweetness was registered by the brain. And they said, we're going to put a little sugar in your tongue. We want you to push that button when you taste that sweetness. Um, and so because we're designed to be attracted to food, our neurological system is designed to be really sensitive to things like sugar. So sugar plays a little trick. It doesn't have to go directly into the brain. Sugar on the tongue touches the taste bud, um, which gets picked up by the sweet receptor, which sends that signal to the reward center of the brain 
back to the finger and those people were pushing that button in less than one second. I think it averaged about seven tenths or eight tenths of a second. Same with salt. I think same with fat, that was a little harder to measure, um, but incredibly fast in the way it's sort of hitting the brain. And, and look, when you look at, when you think about, I mean, the other pushback from the industry was, you know, we've seen brain scans of people on coke and heroin, and their brain is just like fiery red in terms of the imagery that you see. And, and, and you don't get that huge amount of rush of dopamine. Um, you know, which is that that substance in our own heads that we manufacture to get us to sort of want and desire things. But but as as scientists who used to study drug addiction and now study food addiction explained to me that you know the, the food doesn't have to get the brain that excited to to get us to get up off the couch and walk in the kitchen and you know grab that food again because it's it's legal, we're not facing any danger, we don't have to go out and find our drug dealer, it's everywhere, you know, it's deep in our memory channels, which by the way is another way that I think of, of food as being even more problematic than drugs because um, we start developing memory for food at a really early age, possibly even in the womb compared to drug abuse, which, you know, typically happens in the, the teens to the, to the mid-twenties, but the memories we form for food are bigger, stronger, more longer lasting than, than almost anything because what happens is we associate those memories with other emotional aspects of our lives. And that's why Coca-Cola realized that and worked so hard on getting a Coke in the hands of a kid when they went to a ballpark with their parents because that joyous moment will forever in that child's mind be associated with having that soda. And so that's why the industry spends so much time in marketing to kids and using cartoon characters and finding ways to, to sort of take the story of our story of food and, and turn it into this, this marketing tool for them, knowing that children will embed that information in their memories and, and it'll stay with them. Um, it'll stay with them for, for, forever. Um, so that, 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 um, and you know, that's pretty much sort of the first half of book where, of, of Hooked where I'm going through kind of these arguments for, for, or, or science basically for why why I certainly have concluded that, that food is even more problematic. Um, and then it kind of gets even worse because not only do the food companies sort of know that, but they've, they've done certain things to exploit not only our biological instincts, but, but even exploit our own efforts to try to, you know, get control of our eating habits. And one of the things that really shocked me is that you know, back when obesity started to climb in the early 80s, none other than the largest processed food companies began buying up um, the most popular dieting methods. Um, as we were, you know, scrambling to find something to help us regain control of our eating habits. And so you had Heinz buying Weight Watchers, um, you had, um, you had big companies buying Slim Fast and the South Beach Diet and even Atkins. But maybe even more problematic than that, they started going through the grocery store and creating these diet versions of their regular products, which when you looked at the nutrition content, really weren't all that different. But they'd sit next to each other um, on the shelf. And I'm thinking of Hot Pockets and Lean Pockets, for example. And then it was sort of, you know, up to us to decide how stressed out we were that week, whether we we're going to get the hot pocket or the lean pocket, or were we feeling good about our eating habits, or, you know, we kind of like go back and forth like that. And the, the irony of, the, of these companies sort of making products <clears throat> that were causing us to lose control, and then, and then turning around and sort of selling us a solution, quote unquote, to regain control, I found to be to be um, to be deeply ironic. Um, and then to sort of finish up the industry too. So a few years ago, um, there was a meeting in Florida where I am right now, the heads of the biggest companies 
This is different than a meeting I wrote about in Salt Sugar Fat, where they were they got together privately in 1999 to discuss their culpability in obesity and type 2 diabetes. This was an open public meeting with investors and you know, the, the companies were saying one after the other that their sales were declining because more and more people were caring about what they were putting in their bodies. And I remember the, the head of, of, of um, Camel Soup um, just said, look, we are losing the trust of our customers. We've got to do something to regain that trust. Um, and when I saw that happen, I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe here's a chance. Maybe these companies could really sort of turn the corner. But but what we've seen in the last couple of years is kind of even more treachery on their part and, and, and a situation where it's getting harder to kind of tell what's good and what's not so good in, in the grocery store. So, and, and what they've done especially is, you know, they've tried to address our concerns about their products causing us to have cravings and lose control. And so they're doing things like adding protein to sugary cereal, right? On the notion that protein is maybe something that'll cause us to feel fuller faster and eat less, which yeah, maybe it will, but in a, you know, in a much different context than sugary cereal. They're adding fiber to lots of products, even though some of the fiber is made in a laboratory and most of it has not been shown to have the kind of satiating effect that fiber in whole fruits and vegetables um, has. And, and more recently, they've even begun thinking about sort of tweaking our DNA and looking for, you know, little ways to, or, or, or you know, little wondrous solutions of, of possibilities where maybe we'll be able to like one day eat as much as we possibly want and, 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 and never gain, and never gain any weight. Um, and 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 not to be too uh, hopeless in this this whole thing. Um, one of the one of the one of the kind of conclusions I drew in terms of asking that question: What can we draw? What lessons can we draw from the the food industry? Well, it's a few things. One, you know, if you're at one end of the spectrum in dealing with with food, and you know, you've got binging or real eating disorders, obviously you're going to be getting medical help and doing lots of therapies. And there are groups out there patterned after Alcoholics Anonymous where people stand up and say, hi, I'm Michael, I'm a food addict. And, 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 and the emotional support from those groups is, is fantastic. So, you know, they're using abstention like, um, like drug addicts will, but again, with food, it's more problematic because you just can't stop eating. So you, it's a much more complicated kind of, of abstention. Um, but one of the lessons I think you can draw from, from the world of other drug addictions too, is that when, when cravings happen, they come on so strong and so fast that you pretty much need to be executing whatever plan you have for dealing with that craving, whether you know, if it's something simple like a 3 p.m. craving for cookies, maybe your plan is to stand up and stretch or call a friend or eat something else healthy like a handful of nuts. Um, but you pretty much need to be doing that at 2.55 before that 3 o'clock craving comes on or otherwise um, you're going to lose that free will and you're going to lose your ability and the stop brain's ability to sort of step in there and say, hey, wait a minute, I don't think this is a, this is a really good idea. Um, and, and that was the, I think that's the biggest overall revelation for me in, in this reporting, in this research, is that this is not our fault. This is the trouble we're in with food, whether it's, whether it's you know, extreme sort of binging or eating disorders or on the other end of the scale, just that, that, terrible feeling that we've lost the beauty in ritual and in in eating kind of home-cooked meals with family um that's not our fault um it's not a matter of of us not having willpower it's it's these products intentional or not being sort of exquisitely engineered <clears throat> to destroy our free will especially at moments when we're um incredibly vulnerable because of being stressed out or, or what have you. Um, and I could go on forever. You can tell I'm passionate about this, but I'd, I'd love to now um, have more of a conversation and 
here's some of, of your of your questions. Hey, Andrea. I think you're I think you're muted still. In fact, I know you're there. You there, go. We go. there we go. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, you've answered all my questions, so I guess I'll just leave now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, the book is fascinating. Uh, so you briefly touched on this in, in your intro, but when I first started reading the book uh, and you were comparing a food addiction to a drug addiction, which is something that I cover often, and I said, that's ridiculous. There's no way that these things are comparable. And as I read the book, you made very compelling arguments. Uh, and you, in fact, were one of those people that thought the comparisons were ludicrous. What was the moment that made you start to change your mind on this? Um, I think it really was kind of the definition of addiction because I, I didn't really know what addiction was in terms of how <clears throat> experts define it. Um, and, and that really was a big moment for me when the head of Philip Morris, an expert of addictive products, you know, both in cigarettes and, and food, came up with that definition. And, and that by and large is, is a definition that, that scientists use as well in talking, in talking about addictive substances. I mean, psychologists can have some other criteria that they throw in there and, and <clears throat> they might also push back. And, and one of the things they, they, do, they do insist that addiction needs to have is, is a loss of control, right? And I think sometimes they think of that as just kind of this blind, you know, groping for something without thinking of it. But that defines sort of mindless snacking. Um, and, and that loss of control also defines kind of this, this very gradual creep of loss of control that we have um, in becoming um, dependent on, on, on these, these processed food products. Um, so so that, that really was, I think, probably the biggest, biggest moment um, um, for me. And then also kind of realizing that we don't, you know, food doesn't need these harsh chemicals because the brain is making these chemicals, um, dopamine and other things that get us excited about that. So, so it's almost like the drugs are using our own natural addiction, you know, uh, systems, right? They're not, they didn't like, they didn't, they didn't create their own. They're using the systems created for food. And so in, in my mind, that makes total sense now that of course we're, of course food's addictive. We've always been addicted to food. The only problem is that the industry has changed the nature of, of, um, of food in a way that that is made, you know, overeating an everyday thing. Yeah. Um, this being a writer's best, I was, thinking a lot about the language that is used in this book. Um, I know that in the course of reporting, I've had a lot of people email and say, you know, we shouldn't say addicts anymore. We should say person with an addiction, um, you know, substance use, dependency, addiction, et cetera. Did you come across these same sorts of discussions and considerations when working on your book? Yeah, I hadn't heard the addict so much. Um... I guess because I'd gone to one of those meetings of, of and I've, I've, there's several groups, and so I don't want to use the wrong name of the group, but people stand up and go, hi, I'm Michael, I'm a food addict. I mean, there's like no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So, so I think that, but, but what I hear in that is sort of the, is this, and I, th and I think that drug addiction has gotten away from that, but I think not too long ago, we looked at people with drug addiction as having low amounts of willpower. And we kind of looked at them and go, oh, come on. It's just like, you know, just put your mind to it. You can stop that. Or certainly with smoking, we sort of felt that and maybe alcohol too, right? But I, but I think we've gotten, I think we now recognize that it, drug addiction is a disease um, and, and people are incapacitated by, by, <clears throat> by the brain and their body and the substance and, and, and what they're wrestling with. There is not a, a lack of willpower in their part. Um, and, I, and, I, you know, and I think we're not that far along yet with food though. So certainly one thing I've learned is that it's really in sort of salting to 
to say, call somebody obese, as opposed to, you know, saying somebody has obesity, the disease, um, for that reason that I think a good many people, like maybe I did five years ago, before I started this research, you know, looked at somebody who was, you know, very, very overweight and said, come on, isn't there a certain amount of willpower there? I mean, can't you just like, I mean, I didn't say that, thank goodness, but, but you know what I mean. And so, so I, th so I think that language is, is important and it, it depends to, diff you know, to different people, it depends, it depends, you know, it depends on kind of where they are in terms of dealing with that themselves. Yeah. I, just, I, I thought the parallels were really interesting, both in language and all of the science that you uh, reported in your book about how it's not just about individual decisions and personal responsibility. And I see that in covering substance use a lot too, about how it's not just, you know, willpower and you just gotta want it enough. And there are many other factors at play, physiological, biological, et cetera. Um, uh, <laughs> the, one of the things that I immediately thought of when I read your book, you open with a lawsuit involving McDonald's. Mm. Uh, and as I was reading it, I was so hungry and I wanted McDonald's. <laughs> and I was thinking about when I was a kid and my mom would come home with a bag of McDonald's or like you'd be the kid at school who was lucky enough to get McDonald's dropped off to you one day. And like, these are very vivid memories that I had, despite not those not being particularly memorable moments. What is it, a, like, how do those moments stick out to us? What makes them so memorable? How do these companies know how to exploit us? Because like, I'm not fantasizing about sandwiches that I had at the deli as a kid, but it's like those McDonald's moments. How do they do that? Yeah, no, so um, psychologists talk about the adolescence bump, actually. So when we're at, in adolescence, we're creating more memories that are more powerful than at any other time of our life. So some of it is just like targeting kids at that age group um, and um, and associating those products with fun, right? That's why they had sort of the games and the prizes, the Ronald McDonald, the playground at the McDonald's, right? Were all things that tied that food product to to you know a really sweet emotional moment in their lives um and those memories don't go away i mean it's 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 memory is so powerful when it comes to food i was in this kellogg's research development factory in battle creek michigan and they had messed up an assembly line of pop tart dough and they were dumping it into this big vat and the aroma wafted across the factory floor and took me back instantly to my days as a latchkey kid coming home from elementary school, letting myself in the house and having a Pop-Tart, putting a Pop-Tart in the toaster. And that, I mean, it was right there. I was right back in that, my childhood house, having not had a Pop-Tart in 40 years. It's really incredible how, how long that? lasting these habits is, which, which makes it really hard. Um, to change your habits after sort of a lifetime of building those memories. And if if you were somebody who then kept eating McDonald's, you know, regularly throughout your life, just imagine how hard it is then to sort of suddenly go to, you know, want to quit that and, and doing that. You've got like a lifetime of, of memory built up and habit built up, which 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 requires lots of time to to undo. But it can be undone because one of my one of the scientists I've met and spent time with, Richard Mattis, I was kind of pushing him to sort of say what he thought was kind of more a bigger trigger for people, salt, sugar, fat, what have you, cheapness, variety. And he goes, you know, Michael, I actually think that we like what we eat more than we eat what we like, um, meaning that our habits create liking in us and so you know when my wife and i began you know trying to teach her kids to eat broccoli you know she came up with the magic formula of 19 meaning we'd have to entice them to try it 19 times before 
they would start liking it. But, you know, they did start liking it even to this day, my boys. One's now a college senior. He still eats plain steamed broccoli almost every day. It's really pretty amazing how you can form memories for good healthy food um, that are long lasting as you can for as you can for junk. Uh, I just wanted to take a few questions. They're starting to come in from viewers. Um, the first question is from Janice Grant. Is food addiction a first world problem or do poor countries also struggle with addictions? We have seen an increase in diabetes, but what about addiction or is it interrelated? So um, what we've seen are these food giants marching around the globe, um, especially as more people become sensitive to what they're eating, care about what they're eating in, in this country and, and, and in Canada. Um, you see these companies going to developing countries where there are emerging middle classes like in Brazil um, and selling their products um, in much the same fashion that they do here. The marketing, the formulation, getting people excited about them. It's, it's kind of the same thing in, in other countries. Um, and, and that's, I mean, look, salt, sugar, fat was translated into 20 languages. Um, and just yesterday, I got a call from my agent saying that none other than Romania had just signed up to be the first translation of Hooked. And I'm going like, Romania, like, what's going on there? Well, what's going on there is the same reason why a couple of years ago, I was asked to go to Saudi Arabia and give a, a lecture because obesity and type 2 diabetes is rampant in these other countries as they've become, you know, you know, you know, inundated with this kind of American style processed processed food that's marching around the world. And and with that addiction, absolutely, in, in, in the sense that we're talking about. Question two is from Sonia. Can food addiction happen from not having enough food as a child? Oh boy, you know, they've looked at and one of the powerful things here that people are looking at are epigenetics where you know, our relation to something can change really quickly and, and not wait for a full sort of genetic change in our system. And, and speaking of which, the, what Dana Small also sort of has impressed upon me is that she views the situation in her as a mismatch between our genetics and the current modern food environment where we just haven't had time to sort of catch up. But epigenetics, um, it happens faster um, and it's sort of the way that genes are expressed or the way that we're able to make use of, of genes and that can change from generation to generation. There have been studies, there's the famous Dutch hunger study where, um, you know, people who were hungry during World War II um, then became overweight and their children became overweight. So, you know, seemingly as a as a rebound or as a response to being to to, to being hunger so hungry so you know in, in an individual i would yeah i would i would think there may be some things to look at there yeah where being hungry as a child could make you want to want to overcompensate and, and eat more than maybe you should it makes sense to me another question from the viewers how if any uh uh, of these powerful companies are being held to account. Uh, do they truly have free range to manipulate and harm for profit? Yeah, so I mean, I was, you know, I've been really, look, I've been crawling, you know, through the underbelly of this industry for 10 years now. And I'm, I'm astounded at how in so many ways they're more powerful than the government agencies that are, <clears throat> that are there to, supposedly regulate them on our behalf. And, and that was certainly true in terms of looking at food safety. Um, but even, I mean, look at the Obama administration. I mean, Michelle Obama was fantastic in making food sort of a, a public, you know, a, a conversation. Um, and, and, and yet she kind of focused the campaign calling it let's move as opposed to let's cook, right? And Yet her husband was sort of stuck with this enormous job of writing the economy. And so this is an 
industry with a lot of jobs and a big chunk of the economy. And so they're able to argue to regulators that, you know, messing with us can hurt you in political ways too. So, so I think that sort of can, that still continues to this day. You know, one thing people ask me is, you know, whether companies could be sued like, like tobacco companies were. And in fact, Jaslyn Bradley, who I open, she's the teenager who sued McDonald's, um, got some help from lawyers who sued Big Tobacco and won. Um, and the way they won is that they went to states and said, look, let's sue tobacco, not because tobacco is evil, but because you're getting burdened with enormous health care costs from people getting sick cancer from smoking. And that's what led to that huge settlement with tobacco. And so there are attorneys who've looked at big food and said, well, why don't we go after them with the same way? Not to be judgmental or moralistic about these food products, but just there's a clear association between their products and ill health. And, and by the way, there is now. Um, it took 40 years, but the NIH 2019 Finally, a brilliant scientist there finally did sort of a gold standard clinical trial where he took two groups of people, put them in the eating laboratory for two weeks. One got an ultra processed food diet, one got a regular kind of home cooked meal diet and the processed food uh, diet people gained weight. It was the first, it was the first sort of study that actually showed causation of weight gain with um, with these processed food products. So, so yeah, there's that opportunity for going after them in that way. But I, but I think the reason we haven't is that there's something about food that's still different than tobacco in our heads. It's, it's, you know, and I think a lot of that is the marketing, you know, work by the food industry. It's cute. It's cartoon characters. It's like, oh, it's funny. It's fun. You know, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's... This reminds me, in your book, you mentioned going to these flavor houses, which are uh, basically chemical factories where they manufacture all these chemicals that taste like all these foods that we want, but they're cheaper. Uh, and you had mentioned, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's a type of sugar that some people can't even taste, but... Uh, Altodextrin, right? Yes. Uh, you can describe this better than I can, but basically people can't taste it but it makes you desire the food more how is this legal or ethical <laughs> you know i mean they'll argue that look all we're doing is making our products attractive to people and that's 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 really sort of how they justify what they're doing is that look we're just you know i mean they hate the a word they hate the word addictive but they talk about creating you know snackability and craveability so and one of my one of my favorite words is more ishness right making a product to have more ishness meaning to get us to want more and more of it so so you know i and i maybe the maybe the fundamental issue here is that you know food by nature was just something that was really good for us and so it's really hard for us to have that kind of change, that mind change to look at these products, not, maybe we should stop calling them food, that might help. And call, and I think Michael Pollan has sort of has been arguing, you know, arguing for that, this, this isn't food, these are, these are engineered product things and we should maybe be calling them something else, not even processed food. A uh, question from Lindsay Ward. Do warning labels like on cigarettes and alcohol have any effect given what you said about the brain? So I think they did, um, if I'm not mistaken, and I haven't looked at that research well, but I, but I think people who have say that the warning labels and maybe even more so the taxes um, helped reduce smoking rates throughout the world where you have those tickets. And I think one of the reasons is, is that, frankly, we love money as much as we love, you know, processed food and yumminess and tobacco and 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 <clears throat> that tax and we've seen this in 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 the few cities in, and i think mexico too where they've imposed a tax on sugary soda and and sugary snacks um is that that gives us just enough just enough of an edge to kind of say no 
you know, to justify in our heads that well, I don't really want to spend 20 cents on this package paying the tax. I think I can do it. So, right? So if you're in that situation where you, where you need just a little bit of a nudge, a little bit of a help in changing how you value that food, I think something like a tax could, could, um, could, could, could be a good thing and be, and be effective. Question from Karen Giesbrecht. Is trauma related to food aversion or addiction? Do you know if anyone is studying this? Yeah, I did write a little bit about that. Um, and there does seem to be a connection there. Um, and I don't know enough about it to, to talk, but, there, but I know that I have a, a page or two on it in, in Hooked, and there's some references there that you could look up to look at, at some of that research. It's, it's pretty raw research, but they were finding connections there between people who were traumatized um, for whatever reason and um, and losing control over their over their their eating habits um, likewise the researchers at Monell this this research uh, Institute in Philadelphia that I've spent some time in um, realized that the offspring of, of cocaine users um, will be much more sensitive to um, sugar and like sugar more than, than other kids. And so, yeah, there's some real connections there. Uh, knowing what we know and everything that you learned in the course of your very thorough reporting, I mean, what can we do to shift people away from all these processed foods uh, like what advice would you give to people who want to make healthier eating choices? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's the basic advice, of course, which is to spend more time on the edge of the store where the vegetables are, because we should be filling up half our plate with vegetables. But I kind of been, I've kind of, you know, I had this little epiphany a little while ago that a lot of these things I've been writing about that the processed food industry uses against us as weapons, they didn't invent these things. They stole them from us and kind of corrupted them. And that includes salt, sugar, fat. There's nothing wrong with salt, sugar, fat. And when we're using it and cooking food for ourselves, right? Or, or inexpensiveness or, or convenience or variety. Those are all really great things that just kind of got turned on their heads with the industry. So it occurred to me that there may be ways that we can turn the tables on the food industry and take back some of these things they stole from us. And so for example, in our house with, with two boys, we've been trying to drink less sugary um, drinks and um, we've managed to switch to plain seltzer, <clears throat> even my 16 year old, because there's something about the bubbles that excites the brain um, almost as much as sugar. And the science on this is really fascinating because they don't even know yet how we actually taste effervescence in the mouth. Is it the taste buds or is it a, is it a nerve picking up that feeling? Is it the kind of the cleansing action? But whatever it does, we love it. And it's also weird because, you know, it has a little bite. There's a little bit of pain there, right? But it's, there's a kind of a fine line between pain and pleasure and some of our, some of our skin receptors. And so, it, so but here's the really beautiful thing though, is that before there was sugary soda, there was plain seltzer, right? For hundreds of years as a town in Germany called seltzer. They would sit around and argue about the merits of different versions of natural spring water, right? So I love this idea of kind of, and, and so the argument would be the industry took plain seltzer and corrupted it into soda. And, you know, we can turn the tables and take that back and go back to, uh, or go forward to, to what we used to have. Um, I love um, frozen wild grown blueberries. They're coming out of Maine. There's a company, I think it's called Wyman's, um, um, which is like the epitome of highly processed food. They're, they're, um, they're frozen with these gigantic, 20 foot tall steel freezers on the farm that look like futuristic, but they're doing so and they're, they're inexpensive and they're convenient, right? They're frozen. You can eat them all year long. Um, so it's kind of like the hallmarks of processed food, but in a really, really good way. Um, and because they're locking in the nutrition in those frozen berries, 
one could argue even better than than fresh berries if they hang around in your in the store and in your in your fridge too long. Um, but but I love that kind of stealing back from the industry too because freezing food was invented by Mr. Bird's Eye, if you recognize that brand name, um, for fish and for vegetables. You know, way back when, and then it became this glob of stuff in the freezer aisle of the supermarket. And so taking back um, even high technology and using it to our advantage, I think is kind of a really, and there's something kind of really cool and empowering about that, turning the tables on the companies. Question from Harry Wong. Did dietitians or nutritionists that you spoke with offer any compelling points not commonly known? You know, yeah, well, one of the things, I mean, they would say to me is, look, Michael, you know, you harp on salt, sugar, fat, but the first thing we tell people is fill up half your plate with vegetables. And it's pretty simple. You know, the advice that there is out there from nutritionists is pretty darn simple. You know, eat more vegetables, whole fruits. You know, um, there's a couple other things I forget. Michael Pollan has it down really good in a nice little, a nice little uh, phrase. But um, it's it's really kind of pretty straightforward, and and um, and and there are lots of versions of that, obviously. And if you're so, you know, and there's a huge kind of debate out there among <clears throat> among foodies even about whether whether to avoid fat or whether to avoid sugar and 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 creating diets you know Isn't sugar the bad things. one now like fat fat is not i thought that was yeah the yeah if that's not good right the keto and the and the yes and the back to the atkins the low carb and and you know i think what you hear from nutritionists is, is look if that works for you great but just beware of that one of the problems with dieting to lose weight or changing your diet is if you if you turn to something too radical it's really hard to stick with it and that was one of, i felt one of the tragedies of the processed food industry buying the diet industry is that it puts us on this cycle of like you know elation and then depression when we're you know we're not we're not losing weight anymore we're regaining we start blaming ourselves uh, what about this argument that you know fresh, healthy foods are too expensive? And and you've mentioned this um, before in interviews, yeah. but you know yeah. not everyone can afford uh, a pint of blueberries that are five yeah, yeah. dollars, and a pizza can feed a whole family. I know, I know. Yeah, no. So and to go back to the question, of, like what we can do. I mean, I had this dream of being able to take a zip code. <clears throat> and do 10 things in that zip code to change the food environment, right? And you would, you would start by planting a garden in the elementary school, not just to feed the kids, but to get them excited about something like a radish so they could come home and get their parents excited by a radish. But then the parents would have to have a place to buy that radish and it would have to cost less than that two pound, three cheese, four meat, frozen pizza. And then you have to look at the farming system. And so maybe you'd put a greenhouse there because um, 90% of the farmland in this country is growing field corn <clears throat> for processed food and, and, and high fructose corn syrup and animal feed and soybeans. And so you'd want to expand the acreage devoted to vegetables and fruits and nuts, and you'd want to put more research into that so you could grow tastier broccoli. Um, and what else, you know, on and on. And I think at one point I had like 10 things um, that, that kind of that you'd all, you'd have to do kind of all at, all at once, right? To, to really change both your own eating habits and possibilities and the eating environment and to make healthy food accessible and affordable to people. Another question from a viewer. You spoke about seltzers. What about products like Coke Zero and Pepsi Zero Sugar? Are they just a smoke screen to delude people into thinking they're consuming fewer calories when they're not? Yeah, so I think what I hear from people is that, smart people, is that you know if, you, if you're drinking a diet soda and that's what gets you through the day and helps you avoid drinking a regular sugar soda, it's it's probably a good thing and you might as well keep doing that the the worry is that 
One of the things the food industry do, is doing now in response to our concerns about sugar, having you know previously marched around the grocery store, adding sugar to things that didn't have sugar before and engineering a bliss point for sweetness, they're now replacing that sugar with cocktails of artificial sweeteners, fake sweeteners that taste sweet, don't have the calories. And as far as I can tell, the science is still out on what that does to our brain and our metabolism. Um, and maybe we're okay with that, but think about how weird it is when you taste sugar on your tongue and your brain is expecting to get sugar and then it goes into your gut and there's no cal there's no sugar, there's just the taste of sugar. You know, it's easy to, to imagine how something weird could start happening. So I think there's a there's a bigger concern out there about the spread of of these diet sweeteners in not just soda, but all kinds of foods throughout the grocery store. Another question from a viewer. Do governments play any role in this? For example, do they subsidize the ingredients in processed foods? Yeah, I think I think where the big subsidy was that when I looked at it was um, um, in the research and sort of development and the companies themselves put a lot of money into making soybeans and field corn cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to, to grow and to make. And so reducing the cost of that ingredient. And I think that's kind of where the big subsidy is. A lot of it by industry, but also by the government in terms of researching that. And I wrote a story about somebody who was, who was you know, studying ways to, to, to make broccoli growable in colder or extreme climates like the East Coast of the United States, because broccoli hates warm summer nights. So it grows really well in California, where you get those cooling fogs that come in from the from the Pacific, right? But it gets all wilted out and and droops when the the summer night temperatures are too high. So they're looking at way of breeding. They're looking at breeding broccoli, so it can handle those warm summer nights on the on the on the east coast of North America. And so, but you know, very little funding for that. And you can imagine doing the same kinds of things for all kinds of fruits and vegetables and make them much tastier and easier to grow, but, but very little funding support from the government um, compared to the, the research that goes into um, corn and soybeans. Yeah, so we're just coming up on the end of our time here. What I had to know, how have your eating habits changed while writing this book? Yeah, I think one of the ways that I've sort of stolen or I'm trying to steal stuff back from the industry is, is convenience, right? I mean, we have crazy evenings in our house where we don't have an hour to cook dinner. <clears throat> and I now have spaghetti sauce down to 93 seconds, right? You don't even have to chop the onions. Granted, the longer it simmers, I'm not counting the simmering time, right? But you don't have to chop the onion, you just cut it in half. This wasn't my recipe. Um, you know, put the two halves in the in the can of whole plum tomatoes that you put in with a little bit of garlic and olive oil and whatever dried basil is hanging around it. You know, it doesn't. A lot of these things are not very complicated, and um, and you can have convenience and really yummy home cooked meals um, for not a lot of effort. And so, so we've been. Um, We've been concentrating on that a lot, doing more, finding ways um, to cook things ourselves that we're used to, um, just, you know, eight out of the can box. Uh, thank you so much for your time. This has been super interesting. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to add or uh, where people can copy your book? Oh yeah, so I do have a website. It's mossbooks.us. There are um, buy buttons, so you can buy your book um, from uh, maybe your favorite uh, bookstore is in there. Um, of course, going to the library is just as great. And thank you again for the Vancouver Library for 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 supporting this program. Um, but I'm also doing some fun stuff. So you know, I'm 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 listing. 
um, the interviews that I'm doing, and some of them are really great. It's podcasts and CBS This Morning and Morning Joe. And oh, wait, just... I, have, I have to interrupt and ask one more thing. You were on uh, Tucker Carlson earlier. Today. <laughs> How was that? Just like five hours ago, which is why I'm in Florida because he's down here. How it was, was it? Totally, it was totally scary. I had no idea. <laughs> I mean, I really thought he was going to try to take my head off, right? Because, um, well, whatever, that's what he does. But it was like a love fest. He totally gets it. Um, he, he, he gets how food is addictive, like drugs and alcohol and, and cigarettes. And he, he gets, you know, our over-dependence on these big companies. He even started talking about the possible need for government regulation of these food companies. Can you believe it? I was just, my jaw almost dropped. So we had a great old time for like an hour. And I know that Fox is running a promo of the interview now. And I, it's for a, it's for these hour long interviews he's starting to do. So there's, a, there's like a special paywall. So I wouldn't, you know, I'm not encouraging you know, people to go and subscribe, but, um, but it was pretty amazing. And I think the real point was that this is an issue that transcends even the harshest, you know, politics out there, um, and um, and it's and it's a bridge between you know political extremes uh, too. So so that one was a lot of a lot of fun. I'm so glad I did that. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can Thank see you those know. interviews on on my site. Sorry. Hey, thank time. you. No, thank you so much to you both. And uh, it's been a really interesting evening with you, Michael and Andrea. Thank you so much for for hosting this evening. Um, Hooked is available at all of your favorite independent booksellers, uh, also at the library. So get out there and pick up a copy. And Michael, I hope you'll come visit us on stage in person here in Vancouver sometime soon. That'd be really great. Thank you so much. Be well, everybody. Thanks to the Vancouver Public Library. Thank you, Andrea, again. Good night. Be well.